Hey humans, how's it going? Susan Ruth here. Thanks for listening to another episode of Hey Human Podcast. First things first, uh, I have the Amazon portal on heyhumanpodcast.com and it's a great way to help support Hey Human. If you're doing Amazon shopping, you go to the heyhumanpodcast.com website and at the top, there is an Amazon banner. You click on that banner, you do your Amazon shopping just like you normally would, and Amazon will kick back a small percentage toward Hey Human. Um, so it's a really great way to show your support for the podcast. And there's also a support button on the support page of Hey Human Podcast. So if you're so inclined, you want to help support a little more, then please feel free. My social media stuff, y'all know it if you've been listening for quite a while, or even if you just started listening, you probably know it. Instagram.com slash Susan Ruthism is my personal Instagram. And then, of course, Hey Human Podcast is the podcast Instagram. I'm on Twitter, Susan Ruthism. And there's a Hey Human Podcast Facebook, and of course, Susan Ruthism Facebook. Seriously, all over the social medias. Um, If you're into music, please check out uh, my iTunes store. It's uh, got a bunch of songs on there, Susan Ruth. So it's another great way to help support Hey Human, I suppose. Even though it's different, it all kind of helps for sure. Um, You can email me, Susan, at heyhumanpodcast.com. I really appreciate those of you who have been reaching out and uh, suggesting uh, different uh, guests that I might have on the show. It's really helpful because I can't be all places or, you know, see all the things. So it's great getting that information from you guys so I can reach out to people and see if they'll be on the show. But if you want to reach out and just say, hey, or tell me what you think of the show, or if you have any suggestions, again, Susan at HeyHumanPodcast.com. On this episode, uh, Melissa Hogan She is the president and founder of Project Alive, which can be found at projectalive.org. She uh, is spearheading this to get the word out, to raise funds for research and support for individuals with Hunter syndrome. It's extraordinarily rare, uh, and her son has Hunter syndrome. Case has it. So we sat and talked about her experience raising Case and her experience at the helm of Project Alive. It's an extraordinary story. She's an extraordinary woman. My friend Ellen said, hey, you gotta check out this woman, Melissa Hogan, and and, uh, she sent me some videos, which I actually put on Hey Human Podcast's link page, so please do check those out, along with all the other information I posted about Project Alive and about Hunter Syndrome and all that kind of stuff. Um, Definitely take advantage of the links page. There's a lot of information on there. Um, yeah, anyway, so Melissa and I sat down at my kitchen table and had a very uh, in-depth conversation, uh, a moving conversation, and, um, well, I, I learned a lot, and I think you will too. You know, it's, it's interesting to, to be in a position where you're mostly healthy most of the time, and to know that there are people out there struggling, you know, it's very sobering. And it makes you want to just put your arms around the world and, and protect it somehow. And I don't know, it is the season of giving. And yes, I, you know, hawk my own wares by saying, hey, support, hey, human. But happily say to you, if you have a few extra dollars to spare, definitely donate to projectalive.org because it's certainly worthy. All right. Um, I hope you enjoyed the conversation, and again, reach out to me, say hi, Susan at HeyHumanPodcast.com. Thank you for listening. Here we go. Hi, Melissa Hogan. Hi, thanks for having me. Are you kidding? Thanks for being on. I really appreciate it. Um, All right, I'm going to read your stuff here. Lawyer, author, what is your law degree in? Is it specific? It's a general law degree, but I specialized in healthcare law. Oh, okay. Healthcare law which is important considering what we're going to talk about. Uh, Author, founder, and president of projectalive.org, which is really why you're here, as far as I'm concerned. (laughs) Um, And you're an advocate for uh, a disease called, or it's a genetic disorder called Hunter's 
Hunter syndrome. syndrome. Yes. Yeah. And uh, uh, so we're going to talk about that. It's almost exclusively happens in boys because it affects the X chromosome. Correct. Correct. And uh, let's just dive right in. So um, you have a child that case. Yes. That was born with Hunter's syndrome. Yes. He it, was, it did not run in our family. Normally it runs in the females uh, mm-hmm. because it's on the X chromosome, but we're finding that up to a third of the time, it's just a spontaneous mutation. So really anyone could have a child with Hunter syndrome or, or any of these genetic diseases, but it, um, we didn't notice anything at birth. Uh, generally, they seem like a typical child, although he ended up on a ventilator, which was really his first symptom. As a baby? Mm-hmm. Oh. He was born and about five hours old, they realized that he wasn't breathing normally. So What he, does that do to him? I mean, I can only imagine, I know like in the movies, they always go, okay, 10 toes, 10 fingers, mm-hmm. perfect. Yep, that's what we thought. And he was my third child Mm -hmm. that I'd had in three years. Mm -hmm. So it was a little overwhelming. And I think the other people in the room noticed that there seemed to be something wrong. But I was, you know, you have an epidural and you, you know, are sitting there. And so... Cracked out on baby mm -hmm. love. Yeah. Yeah. But he was 10, he was over 10 pounds. So they were checking him for like diabetes and things like that every so often. So they took him back to the NICU and he didn't come back for a while. And I didn't even realize it, but he had stopped breathing in the NICU and was blue and they had to end up um, intubating him. And then he had a lung bleed. And Mm -hmm. so it was, um, it was really touch and go for a little bit. Um, But he was on a ventilator for a few days and ended up coming home and we thought he was healthy. And I asked them, you know, is he fine? And they're like, he's fine. He's great. They didn't have a causation. They just were like, Oh, he's out here breathing air. And well, they labeled it something called uh, persistent pulmonary hypertension of a newborn, which is a fancy name for, (laughs) he had trouble switching from breathing through the umbilical cord to breathing oxygen through his lungs. And I think that's fatal in like 20% of the cases, but there wasn't, they didn't, ascribe it to any particular reason. It just happens sometimes. So we just thought he, he weathered it and he's great and healthy and took him home. It's, it's to me, I think here's this being that has been created and the, the miraculous amount of steps to create a human life, just to have everything come out perfectly. Right. It's, it's more miraculous for a child to be, Perfect. Perfect. I would say that that yes, because all that coding, all that, mm-hmm. uh, it's it's hard to wrap your head around, really. So you bring him home. First of all, you, so you have two other very small children, right? Okay. They were one and a half and like two and a half. So you're one of the bravest people I've ever met. <laughs> it was not. It was not intentional. <laughs> And that's, I mean, that's a funny part of our story is that we thought we couldn't have kids. I had had a number of miscarriages. And so then when we had our first child, we thought, oh, wow, you know, this is, and then little did we know we would then have three kids in a row. Yeah. Um, But it makes you so thankful when you finally are able to have kids that, Mm -hmm. and that's part of how I look back and say, I could have not had kids at all. Mm -hmm. And so how can I really complain Mm -hmm. if there are challenges, you know? All right. So you bring case home and everything seems fine. And then what happens? Well, he he had all these little things and this is what we found in retrospect, especially in like rare diseases or especially rare genetic diseases is they seem fine. And then they start accumulating these little things. So he was a loud breather and he would choke a lot. Mm. So they, they sent us to a specialist to look at that, determined he had something called laryngeal malacia, which is like a floppy larynx. Um, and then he, um, he had a larger than normal head. So at nine months, they sent us to get a head CT and they said all is normal, but, and he had lots of ear infections, lots of respiratory infections. He had a constant runny nose, but when you've got three kids running around and these are all relatively minor. Sure. So you just don't think. And little kids get sick a lot. That's how they grow up to be non-sick adults. Right. 
for a second, let's talk about what this uh, genetic mutation does, because as you were saying, um, these things just sound like normal kid stuff. I mean, maybe not the the bigger head, or but although to me, all little kids have giant heads. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so there's that. But um, uh, what is this? What does hunters do? What's its What's its purpose? Its mechanism. So yeah. it it because they have a mutation at a certain chromosome, the I2S uh, um, spot, they um, don't make a particular enzyme called iduronate 2 sulfatase. And that's a big word. Yes, it's you get so used to saying these big words. Yeah. That's a sugar thing? It's well it's an enzyme that normally breaks down um, cellular waste or these complex sugars in, in your cells. So okay. it doesn't have anything to do with what you eat or anything like those kind of sugars. So it's norm- like what we convert, right? The energy right. we convert is converted to a fuel. Mm-hmm. So it's that fuel. It's the, it's the waste product from, from the fuel. Making the fuel. So okay. they're called glycosaminoglycans. Again, big words. Big words. Um, heparin sulfate and dermatan sulfate. And so normally this enzyme breaks those down and recycles them in our bodies, but in these kids, since they don't have that enzyme, those waste products build up in their cells. And they build up specifically, It's this is in a class of diseases called lysosomal storage disorders. So it's in the lysosome. If you go back to your high school biology, the lysosome is part of the cell. And so these waste products build up in the lysosome. And so these cells, they like swell um, if you can kind of think of it, they, they swell because they're so full and at some point they stop working or these cells start dying. And they're all over your body. Yes. Which is another, mm-hmm. it's not like it's a localized something you can cut out or fix. It's right. It's everywhere. And they're more, they're more in certain areas. It is all over, but a lot of them are, are centralized in heart valves, mm, in mm. the bones, in the joints, in the liver and spleen, and in the brain. Some of the most important things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. I'm going to push our French press down. So as you all out there in listening land hear this, that's what that is. It's a very weird sound. Okay. So, um, so the enzyme isn't, the waste product from the enzyme isn't going away and is it, and it starts to clog. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm going layman's terms here. It starts to clog and then, um, basically that section of body says, Nope, not going to work anymore. Right. And so you that's when, you know, they seem fairly typical as they're young, but as they get older, those cells get fuller and fuller and start uh, dying because they've been filled with these waste products. Why can't they excise that manual? I mean, I'm just throwing out, you know, this, yeah. I know that sounds like a weird question, but they can't get, you know, when the heart has too much fluid, they go in and they right. suck the fluid out. That's not a possibility. I no, because it's in all of these cells. All the cells. So, yeah, um, like I said, it's more in certain, but it's in every cell, okay, like in it. your heart valve, and and so you start to see problems as they get, you know, one year old, closer to two year old. So, he, for example, you know, the the loud breathing, and because his it was accumulating in his airway. Mm-hmm and accumulating in his liver and spleen. So then his stomach started to be larger than normal. And we just thought, we even took pictures. We, we would have him lift up his shirt and we loved this belly he had. And you look back and go, oh gosh, how did we not see? But you just, it's so minor. Well, you so don't minor. know what you don't mm-hmm. know. Yeah. Right? I mean, I mean, I call it like the, the before. You don't even realize that these diseases exist yeah. until it affects you. And how rare is it? It affects approximately 2,000 in the world. So that is a rare disease. It is what they consider an ultra rare disease. Um, yeah. It's there's no real definition, uh, but but rare disease is actually an orphan drug is defined like in U.S. statute as less than two hundred thousand in the United States. So when you look at that and say, well, this only has about five hundred, it's ultra rare. Wow. And as you were saying, the reason why it presents in boys is because it's on X, right? And girls have an extra X. So they, it's, it's very rarely in girls. We've seen it in girls and that's because their other X may have a, a problem. So it's not able to compensate mm. for the, the X that has the mutation. So mm-hmm. normally women are the carriers and uh, they can pass it down to their boys. They can 50, the, the odds are that 50% of their girls would be carriers and 50% of their boys would have the disease normally. Interesting. So 
Okay, so he's starting to have issues. How old is Case now? He's 10 now. Holy cow, that's great. Right. So he was born in 2007 and um, diagnosed at 2 in 2009. How, I mean, how do you even wrap your head around something like that? It was, it was very hard because like I said, when he was diagnosed and he's got a really unique diagnosis story too, we didn't expect that there was anything really wrong. I was starting to think maybe he had some food allergies Mm -hmm. because there's some gastrointestinal stuff that go along with it. But he was diagnosed by my mom, actually. He... So he'd had these little things, but again, we didn't think anything was really wrong. My mom's an RN and she had developed uh, a liking for this particular show that she watched called Mystery Diagnosis about these, you know, rare diseases. And so she would watch this show every week or whenever it was on. And she sat down one Saturday to watch it and started watching it about this little boy. And he had all these little things and it started to feel very familiar and by the end of the show, they tell that he has this rare disease called Hunter syndrome and it's terminal and progressive. And these boys also have a look, um, kind of like um, kids with Down syndrome have a certain look. Well, boys with Hunter syndrome progressively as they progress have this look. And uh, so by the end of the show, she was very concerned that he probably had this disease. And she eventually once she'd been around him a little bit and saw this photo of him with that very distinct look, she told us. And that's how he was diagnosed. TV saves the day for Mm -hmm. once, right? I know. It's it's such an unlikely event, but he would not have been diagnosed for probably a year or two if she had not seen that show. So at two years old, diagnosis is is figured out. Um, What do you do? What do you do for a disease? It's a progressive disease that is so rare. I'm, I'm imagining that funding for extraordinarily rare diseases is not at the top of the food chain. Not like erectile dysfunction <laughs> or, or Alzheimer's or, you know, things right. that, that are taking over the, the, the mainframe. And, and actually, I mean, there's 7,000 rare diseases. And only 5% have some kind of a treatment. But luckily for us, in some ways, there was a, a treatment to at least start on. So when he was diagnosed, there was an FDA-approved drug that could help stabilize the body or some of the physical symptoms of the disease. It involves a weekly infusion. And so we immediately got approved and started going to the hospital for a full day every week to get this infusion, which would help uh, hopefully stop the progression of the disease like in his heart and in his airway. Um, Those are the two major things that that cause death in these boys other than the brain. So we started getting this infusion, which was something. I mean, we were thankful for anything. What, what, it goes down and breaks? Does the infusion break down the the leftover The waste, yeah. So it's a, it's a, a... it's an, called an enzyme replacement therapy. So because they're missing an enzyme, this is a, a made form of that enzyme that you then um, sure. put into their body over about four hours uh, through an infusion. And so it helps break down some of that. And that's why they get it every week because it builds up and then they break it down, builds up, break it down. Unlike us um, typical people, our mm-hmm. body constantly releases it. So it's constantly breaking it down. Uh, but for them... It's break. It's broken down every week, but we had to say, how are we going to save him? Because it's uh, multi-system, so it's in the brain as well. And so this drug did not does not cross what we have. The brain barrier. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is there to keep us alive, obviously, right. keep right. us from getting viruses and weird things in our brains. So we had to Ugh. say, how are we how are we going to save him? And try to figure that out. So, where did that take you? That took us to, I mean, like I said, it was it was pretty astounding, at least for rare diseases, that there was some research going on. And eventually a clinical trial opened that took that enzyme that he was missing, that he was getting weekly, reformulated it, and then they were putting it into the spinal fluid mm. to take to the brain. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so he God, got into poor that. Poor kid. That's got to be so painful. It, it, I've been like a 
needle in your spinal column. Right, right. So initially they were going to use a device like what's a port So mm-hmm. you inject it in there and those weren't working very well. So he had six surgeries um, related to his spine to put these in and take them out. And uh, at some point you just kind of go, you know what, we're just going to have to do this via spinal tap. Does this make him immunocompromised? Is all these surgeries, or is his immune system is still operating at normal? For some of the boys, I think they do get immunocompromised, but he is he is doing well. He doesn't have to have anything that, um, that makes him any more compromised than a typical kid, but he goes in and gets a spinal tap every four weeks oh. under general anesthesia, and he's had... Over 80 at this point. Wow. This and, is the strongest child in the universe. Well, and he doesn't even... So he has special needs. And, you know, um, he doesn't even understand what disease is, much less that he at has two a disease. Or three, you're talking about? Even or, now. Even now. Oh, that's interesting. Well, okay. So at two or three... Or two, two years old, you're getting the diagnosis. You start the procedure of getting him the medicine. Mm-hmm. I mean, I imagine the cost of that is astronomical. Is your insurance company just telling you to screw right off? Or were they... I mean, how do you cover stuff like that? It's... it. They cover it. They do. Because it's such a tiny population of the, of the world. His drug... At that time, it's by weight. So at that time, it was less. But at the weight he is now, it's half a million dollars a year. Okay. And that... Yeah, you feel the weight of that role in the healthcare system that your child costs half a million dollars a year. Mm-hmm. But had he not gone on that drug, he would not have been eligible for this clinical trial, which is a reformulation of that drug that's now helping to stabilize his brain. So as he's as the disease is as he's getting older, the disease is progressing. You can't actually you can't stop it. You can slow it down. Correct? We're not sure. So we he got into this clinical trial, the brain clinical trial, at three and a half. Oh wow! And we think and hope that it is stabilizing his brain. He's still he's learning, but not like a typical child. Um, he, he can do a lot more things. So normally by 10 years old, a child with Hunter syndrome is in, in a lot of cases, wheelchair bound feeding tube, a shunt to drain excess fluid off their brain, uh, lost all language. And, you know, in, in the later stages of the disease. So it's my, I read up on it enough to to be dangerous as they say you know obviously I don't know very much about this disease but um so it's my understanding that the child will any child with Hunter syndrome will develop and start their learning process just like any child and then that will ebb um away as if somebody referred that one of the things I watched they referred to it as if um, the child had dementia yes that's the that's the regular course and that's most of the kids with Hunter syndrome right now by like in our what I call our generation of Hunter syndrome, the kids who are you know eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve are at that stage unless they've gotten into this clinical Program. trial that he's been in, um, which like I said, it has its own significant challenges and it, it n- will never turn them into a typical child. Sure, um, but we just needed to bide time. We needed a bridge until we could get to what would be a cure for the disease. So we're thankful for anything that will keep him alive, keep him, um, you know, f- relatively stable until we could find something that actually stops the disease. So as he's growing older and you are able to have the conversation. Um, how did you have the conversation with him? How did Case come to understand this? In some ways, it's a great thing that he doesn't. So he doesn't... He never had the conversation. No, he. by the time he got into this clinical trial, the disease had already progressed in his brain mm-hmm. enough that it's... I, I liken it to it's, it's progressive brain damage. Yeah. That happens. And so it had already damaged his brain enough that even though he can now 
do some things independently and, and be what we say is we hope relatively stable. His brain had already been damaged enough that he doesn't know what disease is. He doesn't know that he has a disease. He doesn't know that what Hunter syndrome is. So basically we've just told him like for his weekly infusions, we say this helps you run and jump and play. And he'll even parrot it back to you now. He says, I get, I get treatment. We call it treatment. So I can run and jump and play. And then when we go in the hospital, get the drug in his brain, we say, you get that so you can read and learn. And that's really all he knows. That, that was the conversation. Hmm. And has he maintained that, that place of, because of the trial, he's yes. maintained that understanding, that sort of basic grasp of life? We think so. I mean, they do cognitive testing that, that gives you some indication and we think he's stable. Mm-hmm. I mean, he is learning some new skills. But I, even before he got into the trial, he was losing abilities. And it's so slow, and they're right in front of you, you don't even see it. So mm-hmm. when we when we tested to get into the trial and realized he had lost 18 IQ points in eight months, at that point we had to look back and go, oh, yeah, he could say nine word sentences eight months ago. And now he's only saying like on average three word sentences, but you don't see it when it's right in front of you. So that's why I say we want to believe that he's stable. And we, we think so based on what we see him being able to do, but it's hard to know. Is this a painful disease for him? Other than the treatment itself sounds relatively painful, but it can be their joints hurt Mm -hmm. and their joints that's part of the disease is it builds in the joints so their joints can be really stiff so a lot of these kids uh, so before he got in this trial he wouldn't swim in a pool anymore he would only go in a hot tub Mm. and so that's helpful for a lot of these kids to have hot baths and because their joints hurt and they get tired like by the end of the week before they have their weekly infusion a lot of times they're more tired um they're they get more winded and but other than that um It's not painful, except, like you said, the medical trauma has been pretty significant. Yeah. Um, How did the other kids, your other children, handle it? It's Because, I mean, I assume it takes mom and dad's energy and focus, and so they have to come to the table with an understanding that is probably a little beyond their years in the beginning. Yeah, they've... What's interesting is it's all they've known. So he was diagnosed when they were three and four. (laughs) Yeah. And so they've never known a world without Hunter syndrome. And then even he got into this trial when they were like five and six. So they really don't even remember a world before he was in this clinical trial. Mm -hmm. And we, we had to travel. We actually traveled, flew to North Carolina every four weeks for four years. For the medicine. Mm -hmm. Wow. Until we could get it here locally. But so all they have known is that we're, in and out we miss birthdays and we miss events and um but it, it's taken their toll taken its toll they've met a lot of other kids with hunter syndrome and then had to i've had to bring them home from school and tell them they passed away mm-hmm. uh, and i think they're now at this age i mean they're 12 and 13 and they've now you know over time we've had to really educate them about the disease and the fact that it's progressive and the fact that if he had not gotten in this clinical trial he would be in the end stages of disease. And, and yeah. it's, I think it's really hard for them to wrap their brain around it. Yeah. But then also the time it takes from us, you know, I, a couple of weeks ago, our middle son said, um, you know, I want to spend more time with you. I feel like it's, and he can, he can share it well. He said, I feel like it's all about case our, our son with Hunter syndrome and project alive, which is the foundation I run. And, you know, I mean, that's just hard to take in that your child is telling you that. And I, you know, I just have to tell him I'm doing the best I can. I'm just yeah. doing the best I can. Yeah. Um, but it's still hard. Yeah, I imagine. I, I wonder, too, just does your other son understand that that it could have been him because of the way the disease works? Does he understand that? Or is he maybe that's something for a little bit later on? And in, in yeah, I don't know. We haven't really talked about that, but they do see that it's it's random that yeah. it could happen no matter what yeah. to anyone because they've met kids with other rare diseases too. Yeah. And I hope it doesn't scare them in the sense. I hope they have context 
that, you know, sometimes it happens and yeah. sometimes it doesn't. I, I, I mean, they sound like they have smart. I mean, if they're able to articulate to you how they're feeling at 10 right. and 12 and 13, then I have a feeling that they will understand that when it comes time to have that, you know, that thought. Um, Let's talk about the foundation. So, so this is a half a million dollar a year treatment, which, you know, like many diseases, the treatments are extraordinarily expensive and that pays for research and, and that pays, God knows what else it pays. I know there's also, there's an ugly side to it, of course, of where money goes, um, padding things, but, um, so projectalive.org, um, Explain how that came to be and how you came to be the the president of it, the founder. Well, you founded it. With with several other people. Okay, got so it. So okay. we saw that in a similar disease, a number of, it was about five years ago, in a similar disease. So the, the backing up a little bit, the technical name for Hunter syndrome is mucopolysaccharidosis 2. That's catchy. Uh, again, <laughs> it's... That doesn't uh, fit on a bumper sticker no, as well. No, it does not. And so a sister disease, mucopolysaccharidosis 3, which is also known as San Filippo syndrome, they had developed a uh, a treatment in in animals Mm. called gene therapy. Mm. And the the science of gene therapy was advancing. And gene therapy is you essentially take a corrected copy of the gene that is mutated in these kids and you find a way to put it into their body and spread it around. In, in a lot of cases, it's through it's a virus Yeah, that you take the bad parts of the virus out and you put this gene in there and then mm-hmm. you use that virus to spread it around. So they had, they were doing this in a sister disease and three other moms and I were pretty close. Our kids had been diagnosed around the same time. And we said, well, why can't they do that in Hunter syndrome? Let's call them these researchers yeah. at, a, at a research institution in Ohio so we got on the phone and called them and said, hey, um, what would it take for you to start this research in Hunter Syndrome? Mm-hmm. And that's that's how it started. And they said $8 years. billion dollars is what it would take. <laughs> oh, it, it feels like it. It feels like it. Um, but, it, you know, it takes, you get mice, you start with getting mice with the disease. So there are mice that have Hunter Syndrome. Sure. And uh, then you start in the lab and developing this virus vector and, and, and the gene vector and you put it um, into what is what is the gene vector to try to uh, fix the gene in the mice yeah and then I just want to pause human. a moment for science as a huge shout out because it is extraordinary that this technology that this science, Exists. It is. It's, it's extraordinary. It sounds easy to say, oh, we're going to put a corrected copy of the gene, but it is... No, it's is, nothing short of, of God-like, really. It's incredible. Yeah. And when you get down into the nitty-gritty of it, it's way beyond my pay grade. Yes. Um, I understand Mine as enough. well. <laughs> <laughs> I understand enough to be dangerous yeah. and what we need to do and be able to compare. So we actually started actually by monitoring a lot of companies and researchers who were in our space. So even before we called these researchers, we evaluated a lot of them, called them and said, tell us about your technology. Tell us about your research. And we wanted to make a difference instead of just saying, okay, we're going to raise money and and fund this thing over here for $25,000. We wanted to use our own skills to evaluate these programs and, and pick a horse. We said, we, we want to pick a winning horse and really push that across the finish line and so among those four, four moms, I mean, I'm a, I'm a lawyer, one is a psychologist, um, uh, one is, uh, she was a, she raised a lot of money and is now a yoga teacher, actually, she's the voice of reason, and one was in, in the financial sector. And so we said, you know, we, we can evaluate this. And so we did, and that's how we, we picked, picked our horse and rallied the community to start funding this preclinical research, which was you know, 50,000 here, 100,000 there, another 100,000. And then at some point, uh, we knew that it was going to take millions um, mm. in order to really continue it and, again, get to the finish line, which is putting it in humans. I mean, that's not the real finish line. Um, the real finish line is having it available to any child with Hunter syndrome. But it's, it's one, to be able to get it into a child and actually try to save that child. Yeah. All right, so 
So then how does the Project Alive progress? How did, what was your aha moment? (laughs) It was, we were, like I said, rallying people to fundraise to support this research. But when we said, okay, this is going to take millions of dollars. And in order to raise millions of dollars in a relatively short time frame, I mean, of course you can raise millions in 10 years uh, by really pushing it and plodding along. But we said, we don't, it's, it's, it can come to fruition before that 10 years if we can raise the money. We said, we have to have a big idea. We have to have a big idea and we have to reach all the people we don't know. So at some point when you reach the people you know, you can raise a good bit of money, but they get tired and people get tired of having fundraisers or they've given a lot of money and, and you can't reach the 2 million, 3 million. So we, in 2015, Um, Well, we formed Project Alive in 2014 officially, and then in 2015 launched our first big campaign to try to raise more, more money than, you know, you know, we were still, people were still having bake sales and garage sales and pancake breakfasts, but really to reach that larger audience. How did the, how did the debut go? It was, it was great. I mean, that was our first campaign and it was really based on, and that's how Project Alive even got its name was that, um, you know, it just came to me at one point, all these kids want to be something, you know. They want to be a doctor, or they want to be a movie star, or they want to be a songwriter. Um, I wanted to be a lawyer, became a lawyer. But the kids with Hunter Syndrome can't even dream that because they're just trying to live to grow up. And so that was the concept of they just want to be alive. And... um, so we created a video uh, that, that talked about that, that had kids sharing their dreams of what they wanted to be, and then you know expressed about kids with Hunter syndrome wanting to be alive. And I actually, I'm, I'm a little songwriter um, as well, and I wrote a song about that. And so we launched that in 2015, and uh, on social media, it caught on, and we, we raised several hundred thousand dollars, but not the millions that we we needed but it still kept the research going and it it was this year in 2017 where we said we we need another big idea because we need to reach and and we need two and a half million dollars to actually get into human clinical trials wow so oh so that's this year we launched a documentary series yes about families with hunter syndrome which is how i learned of you Right, right. Was that, uh, that that my friend Ellen said you have to watch this this documentary video. It was on a, a GoFundMe or something. Yes. Yeah, and uh, and I watched it and I said, well, hundred percent. Let's let's get her on. So. And that was even an interesting. You know, I just believe. You know, I subscribe to a couple of philosophies really every day, and one is to whom much is given, much is required. And I felt like we've been given this gift of our child getting in this trial and having a bridge, and I had the bandwidth to to run the organization and push and push whereas parents whose children were already progressing severely they were doing 24 hour nursing care and you know they they had to put their child first and it's not that I'm not putting my child first as well but I have the the room in order to to try to work on that and so um, as and also the background I mean what are the chances that a person yeah. who is not only a lawyer but a lawyer within the health industry, right? That was your... Yes. So... Well, and actually what's funny is after I stopped practicing law, I was a strategy consultant. Mm. And so I would do... So you were being groomed for this... It's a Purpose. crazy story. Is it though? See, I I, I, I like to look at things like this and see the miracle in it, see mm-hmm. the beauty in it. Not, not from a religious standpoint, but in the beauty of the way things come together in horrifying circumstance. And that's where I say, you know, not everybody has the same talents and we all just use what we have in order to serve the community. Right. And that's how the documentary series came about because this family, their child was diagnosed uh, in the fall of 2016 and the father is a filmmaker in Charlotte, has a production company. Mm. And so we, they found us on social media. He and his wife, uh, or his wife and I met when we were in North Carolina for the clinical trial and instantly hit it off. And she said, look, you know, um, my husband makes 
movies and tells stories and makes commercials. And I think we might be able to do something here. So we talked and he said, here's my idea. I want to make a documentary series and tell the stories of these families because I believe if people really knew them, that they would want to step in and help. Yeah. And so that's how it all started. Yeah. What is, um, for Case, what is one of his most shiny characteristics in all of this? Oh, his smile, his joy. The thing is, he just lights up your day. And I always say, when he's around, I can never have a bad day. Because how can you not be thankful, one, that he's alive, and two, that he can still smile and laugh. And so it just, it brightens every moment. Every day I say, I wake up to a miracle every day. Mm -hmm. And then I'm just trying to make more miracles. Yeah. That's it. Just trying to make more miracles. That's beautiful. Is he mobile or is he in a wheelchair? He is mobile. Oh, that's oh, great. Really, really mobile. Really, really <laughs> <He> well. <runs. laughs> One of the characteristics of the disease is they have um, a diminished sense of safety. So uh, he... he in, in, internally they do? They, their, their mind gets scared easily? Is that what you mean No, by that? Um, they're not scared. Oh, fascinating. So they, before the clinical trial, it was, he was very dangerous. We, we had a CNA in our house five days a week because he would have. What's a CNA? Uh, a, a certified nursing assistant. Yeah. I just went, yeah. Okay. I was going to guess, but I was like, oh, you're going to sound like an idiot if you get that wrong. Well, he, and he, cause he would, he would stand at the top of the stairs and like jump. Like mm. he, he thought, you know, he would have run in front of a car, jumped off a building, just no sense of safety. The, the gate within the brain had, had been turned had, off. Right. Well, that's fascinating. So now he's, he's better. He's better at it now. He still doesn't have a typical child. So I have to worry about him running in front of cars, um, you know, having, having a real sense of what can injure him. So has neuroscience stepped in? Uh, obviously, there's, there's got to be neurologists on the team that are working to find a cure since it's an, an, is right. that an encephalitis type I mean, no, it's not encephalitis. It's it, yeah, the this there is inflammation. There's a lot of what they call downstream effects, and okay. they haven't really teased out what what all of those are. So they're trying to trying to get at the root of the problem, even though they know that there's downstream effects, and that's why he's not. Even though he got into this trial, he's not able to to be a typical child. Sure, because of all of those. See, but this fascinates me because if his his sense of of safety has gone out the window and he just goes for it. Mm -hmm. That's a real particular place in the brain, right? So is it always attacking particular places in the brain? What would it, or is it just a a side effect of? They're not really sure. So they've done some MRI studies of the brain, but there's so few kids that it's hard to do these studies that, that tell you more about the disease when really you want to be in a study that treats it. I understand. Yeah. I'm just, yeah. I, it would seem to me if, as an, if I were a neuroscientist, I would be all over that to try and help the research, right. you know, because there's actually quite a lot of money in neuroscience. So, and I think they're like, doing, they're doing more and more of that in these yeah. diseases because we found too, that rare diseases really help you understand more common diseases. Sure. Um, because like in this disease, it's, it's what they call monogenic. So it's a single gene defect. And so you can isolate a lot of things related to particular genes and these rare diseases that then can help you understand things that are more complex, Mm -hmm. like cancer or Alzheimer's Mm -hmm. that aren't related back to a single gene. Right. Um, So it's, I mean, it's fascinating from a science brain perspective. And it's sometimes I laugh that I can, I can compartmentalize my fascination with the disease and the treatments and the business aspects of the pharmaceutical industry and clinical trials and and then go over here and and feel the weight of it on my particular child. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's cause specific for you. Right. Obviously. Um, <clears throat> so the goal of Project Alive is for the millions of two point five million dollars. Where are you in that goal so far? Right now we're at about six hundred and the last I checked about six hundred and thirty thousand. Okay, so everybody listening, um, go to projectalive.org if you are able and donate. You know, as I like to say, even a dollar. Right. 
even in the cost of your daily Starbucks or whatever, I mean, we all have our little things that we love. And one day without isn't a big deal. So if you can and, and, and you're willing, please do that. That would be awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so how are you? You're married. Yes. Obviously. Um, I would venture to say that situations like this can be very trying on a marriage. So you, is he part of the foundation? How do you guys navigate that? It's... I mean, it's a rather personal <laughs> question. I don't mean to be you know, rude or anything. I just, I'm curious because I think for other people out there who have children, who have issues, whatever the issues are, um, I think statistically, it's very hard for the parents to maintain their togetherness. Because it, their focus yeah. is so on this child. It's been the challenge. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest. And yeah. we've, we've talked about this, especially more recently, too. Uh, but you have to be intentional about it. So at the beginning, it was really so many logistics. He was in and out of the hospital. We were at the hospital every week for infusion. So we had to communicate on all these logistics. But really, the emotional processing of it, a lot of that we did separately. Mm. Because it was, I think... I cried every day for about a year. You know, it gets less and less. And men, I think, handle it differently. So he was angry and, you know, why why our child? But, you know, you have to really come back together and say, look, we're a team. And I think every, you know... It, you know, marriage is in waves. Of so <laughs> Any marriage is in waves, absolutely. And, um, but it, it has been interesting because he... He... he supports me in the work that I do and he helps things related to the foundation but his schedule is also very busy he travels a lot what does he do he is a a speaker on money and leadership oh okay and so he talks to lots of people we laugh and say we do similar things yeah uh because I I write and talk at rare disease conferences but about totally different topics but people have realized now especially with this campaign and we've been on tv more and and things like that they're asking him more about it. And so mm-hmm. it's it's an interesting blend of, you know, that's not normally what he talks about, but it's a part of his life. Uh, so it's it's not something that you, you avoid. Yeah. Um, or you can't avoid. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so now that Case is in this trial, he's going to keep on keeping on, right? That's the... We hope so. It's again. This it's is a, stop the progression, is it not? It's, we we think so. It's, okay, um, but there's also the fact that they can develop antibodies to oh to this uh, because it's a manufactured form of the enzyme. So even with the the body, the weekly infusion, or with the one into the brain, they can develop antibodies to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, if he didn't get it for some reason, he would decline just like he would have otherwise. They have to regularly get it, so it's not FDA approved. It's still considered an experimental drug, and and in order for it to move forward, that would have to be FDA approved. So we're we have so many angles to this. You know, we're trying to make sure that gets FDA approved, so these kids can have, like I said, a bridge or biding time until we can, you know, do something that's more permanent for them. Sure. And most kids are not on that that clinical trial. Um, That's a a very small portion. Is it dependent on where? case was when you know uh, where his where the breakdown had happened you know what I mean like where, right where he was I'm trying to think there was a word. criteria there were all yeah. these criteria yeah. that you had to meet in order to he get couldn't have progressed that. a certain po- to right right so the kids who had we had cases there's several cases actually of people who'd had multiple children with Hunter syndrome so oh, that geez. happens because their first child because they seem typical they have like for us if my if I had been a carrier and my oldest had been diagnosed, it's possible that all three of my kids could have had it. And we know people who have two kids or three kids because their oldest doesn't get diagnosed until they've already had the other children. And so some people, they, in a couple cases, the older child was too advanced in the disease mm. to get into this trial, but their younger child did. Oh my gosh. So I they're, can't, half, that, yeah. Yeah, they're having to watch their younger child have opportunities and be stable while their older child is is losing all of their abilities. It's, I mean, it's horrific. It is horrific. Um, And I imagine too, so you're not a carrier. This is a genetic just hiccup in, in cases DNA or 
in his yeah in his his DNA, DNA at conception it just something just hiccuped and, yeah yeah um and that's not uncommon like i said we think it's probably in a third of the cases that that happens oh yeah i mean if if we pulled apart our dna and looked at it we'd find lots of mm-hmm. bumps and whistles but we all have compensatory you know right other there's so many things that can go wrong yeah, and most of them and we replicate don't replicate also and so when the replicating genes come along you know they're they're like oh this one's broken let's get in Fix there it. yeah yeah but even that sometimes is broken in people so it's right. a whole other thing but um how so when you meet new families that have this disease or is it a disease it's not it's a genetic i mean yeah, I, they I guess call it like, disease disorder okay. lots of different things um, so do do you help get new kids into the into the program with Project Alive? Do you help them get placed, or do, is that not something you do? Or we do everything, or as much everything. as our bandwidth allows. Yeah. I mean, I work full time. Um, I mean, obviously pro bono for the foundation. Sure. And we have lots of other families who volunteer. So sometimes mm-hmm. people are diagnosed, and and when the trial was open, we would you know try to educate people on on what the pros and cons or Mm -hmm. forward them, you know, to the right places for information and, you know, help them understand the disease, help them understand the weekly infusions. A lot of times there are questions about how things are done or what doctors should they see. So for a long time, even before having Project Alive, the team of us that, that lead it have been helping people in that way. So that's really a personal thing that we've always done, but it's really part of what Project Alive does too. But we also work with researchers and companies that are researching in hunter syndrome to help them understand the disease understand the community um again we're pushing treatments forward toward fda approval and things like that so it's whatever can help help these families and kids how difficult is it to get the fda approval on these trials these human trials i mean i imagine they're monitoring for for um I hate the word side effects. I think it's such a silly moniker because it's not the side effects. It's the effects. Right. Yeah. <laughs> there is no side effects. You take a drug and you have all these effects. Right. What they should say is the effects you don't want. The unintended happen. effects. Yeah. The unintended effects. <laughs> right. Or the, the annoying effects or whatever. Yeah. But side effects is such a silly... To me, it's silly. But um, are there... First of all, are there adverse effects to this medicine? And secondly, uh, how, what's the process to get the FDA to say, okay, this is something... It's challenging. I mean, to go all the way to FDA approval is a challenge. And we've had, like I said, he's had challenges with this device that have been a part of the trial. So it's more the device than the the drug. Than the drug, right. Than the drug, yeah. And so there have been a couple times where either the hospital or the FDA has said, wait, wait, you need to, to pause here. They call it a clinical hold. But we really got involved in both circumstances where that happened and said, look, the disease is worse than this um, challenge or this um, the reason that you're you're placing a clinical hold on this, whether it's related to a device or or different things that were happening. That's going to be terrifying, first of all, to yeah. to have the FDA go, nope, now you have to stop. When you see it working, right. and then this governmental power gets to play God with your child. And that's what happened. They they stopped um, enrollment of the trial, and I knew that kids I knew were declining, and if they didn't open it up soon, by the time they opened it up, these kids would be below yeah. the threshold to get in, and that actually happened. Yeah. And it was, it was horrifying. Um, and so, you know, I'm very frank in my discussions with the FDA. So I also serve as a patient representative to the FDA, which means you can give color and insight into There's that certain diseases. Coming in. <laughs> um, but I'm very frank. I said, look, I have no ax to grind. I have no, um, agenda other than saving kids. So I hope you will listen to that. And so that's what I said. I said, look, you need to. And so we actually went and met with officials of the FDA, and they ended up opening up um, uh, enrollment sooner under different um, different qualifications uh, to allow some kids to get in sooner. Now there were still kids that had already progressed just in that, I think it was maybe six months that they had had a hold yeah. uh, on it that didn't then qualify. And so... It's, yeah, it's horrifying because you have a limited amount of time. You, your kid gets diagnosed at two and you automatically start calculating, well, the average lifespan is, 
maybe 12. And so I only have maybe, you know, 10 years. And so in that time before they lose too much, I've got to try to save them. Yeah. And that's, do you feel that the research, if well-funded, um, is going to get to a point where they can reverse Hunter syndrome? I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, I, what I hope, and this is what I've, I've consistently said with respect to the trial that my son is in or with gene therapy, you know, our greatest hope is for, at this point, for s- stabilization. Um, yes, it would be fabulous if we could reverse it. Um, well, I take that back in some ways. I mean, my son is so innocent and wonderful. I mean, I wouldn't wish it on anyone. It's terrifying and horrible. Um, but I, I tend to not have regrets and say, you know what? I'm not going to regret that this didn't reverse it and turn him into a typical child or I love him just how he is. So my hope for, for gene therapy is that it can stop the progression and if given in kids who are who are young enough, maybe the disease never even manifests in terms of damage to the brain or to the body, and um, and that's that's really the hope, and and that's what we've seen in in mice that um, you know there is some once they've already been impacted, there is some there's stabilization and there is some improvement even, mm. um, but you know I don't you know, I don't want to give false hope. Sure. Um, and I think that's that's hard because when your child is diagnosed, you just want life to go back to how it was. And it takes a while to realize, hey, you know, this is a different life than what we thought. But it doesn't mean that it's a terrible life either. Right. Um, in fact, it has a lot of joy. Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, that is an interesting question. If you had to do it all over and, you know, somebody whispered in your ear, oh, this child is going to have this issue. You know what I mean? Right. Would, would I change it? Yeah. I, I actually wouldn't. And um, and I think, I mean, some might think that's easy to say because we, we think or hope my son is stable. It's your son. You love him. And, yeah. But, you know, like I said, it goes back to the fact of I could I could have not even had been able to have kids. So how can I, how can I, you know, rail at God or the heavens or whatever and say um, I wish it had been different? Right. Because I'm a different person than I'm a very, very different. And so is my husband. Now, and, you yeah. mean and because of this? Because of this. And I feel like I'm mm-hmm. more compassionate, have more grace. Um, I'd like to think so anyway. Do you believe in God? I do. You do? I do. Which I, is, I, I, would, I'm guessing it's quite helpful in this situation. <laughs> it would be hard for me um, to have lived this life without, without um, believing that there's a purpose and what will happen and... Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, if if you could have these sort of philosophical conversations with Case, it may in fact be that he would say, I had to be in order for X, Y, and Z to happen. Without yeah. Case, you know, there'd be no you, or without yeah. you, there'd be no Case. I mean, they'll go, they go hand in hand, right? So, yeah. and without you and, and what your capabilities are, there wouldn't be Project Alive. Without Project Alive, there wouldn't be funding. Without funding, you wouldn't be able to try and find a cure, which may happen one day. So patient zero being case in his, in his own way, right? right? He's, he's the touchstone for what may be something, maybe it's 10 years from now, maybe 20, you know, but. Well, and I go back to, you know, I go back to him and I go back to these other boys of my, my close friends. And I say, you know, if I get discouraged, or if I say, you know, this is just, I'm, I'm anxious about what's going to happen. I say, look, if I go back to why am I doing this? Because, you know, I want to save Case. And that was originally the blog that I wrote was a blog called Saving Case. And, you know, I want to save Jack. And I want to save Declan. And I want to save Trey and Finn and, and all, of the, all of these boys. And just say, if that's my guidepost, then... Um, then nothing is, you know, I, I can't say that it's too hard or it's um, not worth it uh, because y- you love. And, and that's that's what it's really all about is loving families and loving kids. And this is just the tangible way I'm doing it, I think. It's beautiful. I'm, I'm, thank you for your service uh, to the world. And thanks to Case for his service to the world. I mean... When you get right down to it. Yeah. And, and I say, sometimes I say, what if he's more perfect than me? 
because he loves so innocently. Yeah. And and is just happy and you know, does things without griping and said, who am I to say that I'm better than that? Mm-hmm. You know, so it's very inspiring. Yeah, the, the few people I know who have children with Down syndrome, uh, they they would they say the same thing. Mm-hmm. You know, that it's it is like looking upon the face of God because this child is as pure as and as loving as it gets. Right. So that's why I say I don't know that I would change it. Yeah. If, um, if I had the opportunity yeah Uh, thank you melissa for coming on and talking about uh this hunter syndrome uh the again the website projectalive.org for all of you listening um time money all these things are important if you can please give thanks for being on the show thank you so much for having me absolutely bye everybody bye